Hi, well, good morning to, uh, to all of you and welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Blackwell and I help to coordinate the work of the Norwich Society Historians Group. Uh, today, we're very pleased to have Sophie Cabot with us, who's going to give us a, a talk today. Um, welcome to uh, all of you who are not members of the society and uh, uh, may I say that let me recommend that you join us. Uh, Norwich Society does a number of great things. Discovering the history of, the, of our city is one thing, but helping to preserve Norwich as a fine city for the future is also very much a part of what the society does. Uh, you know, talks, uh, visits, trips, a lot of things. And if you could join us, that would be great. So um, welcome to, to Sophie Cabot. Uh, she's a community archivist at uh, the Norfolk uh, Records Office, and I'm just chatting with her before we start, and she tells me that it's now fully open again for those of you who'd like to go there and continue with some research. Uh, Sophie's background really is in archaeology, and some of you may know her as the secretary of the Norfolk and Norwich Archaeological Society. Uh, but in, in her work at the Records Office Communities, she's become particularly interested in the history of the Jewish community in Norwich, something which is not well known. Um, and she will tell us today a little bit about the medieval times and later times from the 18th century onwards. It's a fascinating story, and we're very pleased that you've joined us, Sophie. So I'll turn the time now over to you. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here and wonderful to have so many people on the call. So I'm just going to try and share my screen and switch over to the slide. So my plan today is to tell you a little bit about the historical and archaeological and artistic and all kinds of evidence for the Jewish communities in Norwich. There are two little stories, a story of a medieval community and then a story of a community post the readmission of the Jews into England. Um, there's quite a lot to get through, so I may go a little bit fast, and there's a lot of writing on some of the slides, so I'm very glad this is being recorded and you can peer at them in detail at your leisure. But uh, I hope I'm going to give you a sense of two interesting and dynamic communities that have helped shape the city and about which you may not know very much. Okay, so to start with the medieval community, we're talking about a period between the 11th and the 13th centuries. And I'm going to give a little basic chronology. So at the moment, there's no evidence that there were any Jews in England before the Norman Conquest. That's not to say that no Jew ever was in England, either during the Roman occupation, which is very likely, or slightly less likely in the early medieval period, but they weren't a recognized residential community and there's no mention of them in sources. There's one object, which some of you may be aware of in the Castle Museum collections, which suggests that there was at least an awareness of Jewish culture in Anglo-Saxon England, but it is in fact a Christian object. It's a little lead pendant about this big. And on one side of it, it has a crucifix. And on the other side of it, it has the name of God written in Hebrew. So it's an interesting object. It relates to somebody who obviously understood Jewish uh, ritual use of the name of God, but it's not a Jewish object. So the first population of Jews to settle in England probably came from Rouen in Normandy. So it's a good Norwich connection uh, at the express invitation of William the first or second sometime just after the conquest. They settled in London and then they spread out to other towns and cities over the next 50 years or so. And the first community in Norwich is attested in documents from 1144. So that's the beginning of our Norwich story. And then the Jews were expelled from England by royal decree in the year 1290. So we've got about 150 years that we're talking about the late 12th and the 13th centuries. And these are the key recorded events. The gray ones are national, the dark ones are Norwich events. There is a person called Isaac in the Doomsday Book for Norfolk. Um, Isaac wasn't a common Christian name at the time. So that may be a single Jewish person. Then you've got this 1144 attestation. In the 1150s through to the 1170s, we've got events associated with the anti-Semitic text 
Thomas of Monmouth's Life and Miracles of St. William of Norwich, which we'll uh, look at in more detail in a minute. In 1190, we have a historical record of violence against the community, and again, we'll return to that. From 1232 or three, that financial year, we have the cartoon of the Jernip family on the Norwich Exchequer Roll, which some of you will be familiar with. A very interesting piece of art. We have more rioting recorded in 1235 and then the expulsion in 1290. So most of the historical recorded events are what you might call negatives. Um, that's because of the nature of the recording. These are mainly legal documents. Um, there were particular legal rights that pertained to the Jewish community, and they caused quite a lot of the disquiet between communities in the country. So Jews were permitted to move about the country without paying tolls, to buy and sell goods and properties, and to sell their pledges after a year and a day, uh, to be tried by their peers, by other Jews, and to be sworn on the Torah rather than the Bible. Um, special weight in court was attributed to a Jewish person's oath because of their close relationship to the king. Um, those are all things that people could obviously and did sometimes resent, but the important one for us to understand is this special relationship between Jews in medieval England and the king directly. And as many of you will know, the relationship between royal authority and city authority was always a source of tension in Norwich as well. So who are these people? We think that in the 150 years we're talking about, the city population may have fluctuated between five and 10,000. And at the peak of that, there might have been as many as 200 Jews. So quite a significant community in the city. There appear to have been three broad classes of the families. So there are major financiers. Those are people who are active on a national or even an international financial stage. Uh, there are smaller scale financiers lending money locally or in groups. And there are families who can't afford to lend money. And it can be assumed that those people mostly worked in the service of the wealthiest families. Um, of those, the family of Jernit represents by far the wealthiest and the most active over several generations. And they rather skew the record for Norwich because um, they are so wealthy that they are quite different from other kinds of people, even within the Jewish community. Um, there are about six wealthy families, about 12 middling ones. Um, but again, almost all of this information comes from the documents of the money lending. So it may well skew our understanding of other people in the community. We know, for instance, that there must have been people who provided essential Jewish services. So there would have been a, a butcher and a baker, probably a doctor, all sorts of other craft activities where they were not allowed to trade with the Christian communities, only with other Jews. So they don't appear in financial record keeping. When we think about where, we need to get rid of an idea many of us are lumbered with, which is that of a ghetto. Jews could and did live in various places in Norwich, and they were under no compulsion to live in a particular place. Um, they also lived in small towns, so there were Jewish communities in Thetford, in Bungie, in lots of small places. But as in other royal cities, the majority of the community lived close to the centre of royal power at the castle. And that area, which is a piece of land in historically in the castle ditches, but now defined by White Lion Street and the Haymarket to the north and Rampant Horse Street and Little Orford Street to the south, that's referred to as Jewedicimus, that part which is most Jewish. Or if you're speaking Middle English at the time, the Jewry which is the normal European term for a place in a city where Jews live. Um, so I'm going to show you a plan which shows how we know that. It's property demonstrably owned by Jews, although you can't actually tell whether Jews were living in it or whether it may have been let out. So all these numbered properties. And the red star in the centre 
is the possible location of a synagogue, which again, we'll come back to in a minute. So how do we know all of this? Almost all of it comes from documents, as I've said, and I'm not that kind of a historian. I don't have medieval Latin, much less medieval Hebrew. So I'm heavily reliant on Vivian Lippmann's historical work, The Jews of Medieval Norwich for this, which has not been surpassed or indeed updated since it was written in the early 1960s. So if there are any potential PhD historians out there with medieval Hebrew, it's a job that definitely deserves looking at. Um, one of the issues with those documents is that they're almost all financial or legal in their nature. They preserve people's names through property transactions, marriages, loans, court cases. Um, they don't talk about day-to-day -day life in any real way. There are some religious authors, particularly towards the end of the period, who comment on English jury. They hardly ever talk about named individuals, um, as is the tendency when other communities are talked about. They tend to say, oh, Jews do this, Jews do that. The problem with Jews is this, but they're not describing individuals. Um, then there's an extremely limited amount of other material, some archaeology, some literary, artistic and folkloric evidence, which I'm perhaps better qualified to focus on. So I'm going to take you through some of that. First of all, many of you will be aware of this house. This is one of the ranges of the house now called the Music House on King Street. Um, this is the range with its short end to the street. And actually, it's only the undercroft level of the building that is the date we're talking about. Um, it's commonly referred to as Jernitz House, but actually the Jernitz didn't build it. They leased it and lived in it for quite a long period. The important thing to take from that is that this is just a very grand Romanesque house. This is the sort of grand house that rich people lived in in Norwich in that period, whether they were Jewish or not, and nothing about it is specifically Jewish. What you can see when you visit it, and I hope you will be available to visit it soon, uh, it's currently closed for complicated reasons, but hopefully some of you have been in it, is this area on the right of part of the fancy door that led in from the porch into the main building and the vaulting of the undercroft in what is now Jernit's Bar. You have to make your way in through a very unfortunate pottery mask of Shylock created by some adult education person in the 70s, which I do wish they'd get rid of. But uh, that's the only thing currently on the building to remind people of its Jewish heritage. We then have some potential sites where there may have been synagogues in the city, and some of these are more certain than others. Holtor Lane, which is referenced in one document might be around Dove Street, and that would be before the 1150s. But it's equally possible that Holtor, which is a very strange word and not otherwise parsable in Middle English, is simply a mistake. Um, people have suggested Holy Torah and Holy Tower and all sorts of odd understandings of that, but uh, there's very little evidence other than one passing reference that that was a real place. What's much more likely is a synagogue on the Haymarket site in the Jewelry. Um, that's a building described in detail by Bloomfield, and unfortunately, as you will all know, Bloomfield never tells us where he got this stuff. But it seems likely that he had reason to believe that there was a building of some substance there, which was described using the Latin words the scola and its hortus, so the school and its garden. Scola is a very common use for synagogue. In fact, it's the one most commonly used by Yiddish speakers as well, the word shul, which is used for modern synagogues. Um, and that's likely to have been used by medieval Christians because they used the word synagogia in a theological sense in Christian writing, so they didn't use it to describe the buildings used by Jews. So this scholar may have been a synagogue and its hortus may even have been a small cemetery. Uh, it's not natural Jewish practice to have a cemetery adjoining a synagogue, but it did happen in places where Jews lived surrounded by Christian communities. <laughs> 
There are some bits of medieval glazed roof tile and fragments of stone from that site. Uh, they were excavated before compulsory development archaeology. And we know they came from that site, but we don't have perfect records. Um, they came from the infill of a well. It may represent a building that was demolished in the 13th century, which would work with our narrative, but it may not. Um, the recent expansion of the Primark site didn't show any further clear evidence, but uh, the site had been really damaged over the years, so that's not entirely surprising. These are the sort of things, uh, you know, these are 13th century green glazed pottery. Um, they're not distinctively or intrinsically parts of Jewish culture. They're just reasonably high status medieval objects, tiles, pots roof tiles from around there. This is the story everyone is more likely to know something about. Um, this is the so-called Norwich blood liable, although strictly speaking, it isn't actually a blood liable. Um, this is one of the stories that I feel makes people uncomfortable about engaging with the Jewish history of Norwich. So I want to go very clearly through what we're talking about here, um, because it's not a dead issue. Blood libels still take place all over the world and people are still attacked on the basis of them. And in Norwich, we still live surrounded by lots of things called St. William's this and that. Um, so we've never really faced up to this. But this is a text written by a monk called Thomas of Monmouth called The Life and Miracles of St. William of Norwich, which was written about 1150. It purports to describe events in 1144, so before the author was based in Norwich. So it might be based on lost records, but it's more likely to be based on either hearsay or entirely invention. The ritual elements of the story are absolutely certainly entirely fictitious, and that's a very important thing to keep a grip on. It describes the ritualized killing of a Christian apprentice boy by a group of local Jews in a mockery of the crucifixion, supposed to have taken place up on Mousehold Heath. It's not, as people will sometimes tell you, the first blood liable. There are versions and precursors of this canard going right back to the first century in the Greek world. This is just the oldest one that's extant from medieval Western Europe. And I describe it as an anti-Semitic canard, which is a, a sensational report, a misrepresentation there are a number of them. They go around and have done since the Middle Ages. This is a pretty common one. Many of you will know that this one also appears in Chaucer, for instance. Um, the reason for Thomas of Monmouth, with the encouragement of William de Turbeville, the bishop, to promote this, to try and get it up and running, is almost certainly in their interest of creating a lucrative pilgrimage center in Norwich and trying to knock Ely off the top spot for East Anglian pilgrimage. Um, pilgrimage cults are of enormous value to medieval churches and Norwich really was held back by the fact that it didn't have one at the height of the Middle Ages. So they tried to get the cult of St. William going and to some extent they exceeded, but it was always a smallish cult. Um, not many sites or images associated with it survive. Some of you will be aware of the overgrown ruins of a chapel on Mousehold Heath, which again is probably in its origin older than this story, but was then rededicated as the supposed site of the discovery of the body of St. William. Um, there are a few images. I've chosen one of the least horrible ones here, the one from St. John Madden Market, which you can see at the V&A, which shows a child with the instruments of martyrdom. And that was commissioned in the 15th century by Ralph Seagram, a city grandee. And you can show that by then, this was considered a mainstream saints cult for the city. But otherwise, there aren't very many of them. Very shockingly, the most recent one that I've been able to find is an Edwardian one, which is on the rather horrible Reridos at St. Lawrence Church. I don't recommend it. 
Another story some of you will know is that of the Chapelfield find, and it was the discovery of this site that really drew me into being a bit of a spokesperson for Jewish heritage in Norwich. When I was working at Norwich Heart and television production company asked us to be involved in the making of a television program about this site. It was a, a grave mistake as it turned out to do that, but it did lead to a lot of interesting material. So in 2004, at the very end of the development of the Chapelfield Shopping Centre, um, at, at the site where Woolworths had been on St Stephen Street, when they were punching through for the entrance into the shopping centre, they found a well containing 17 extant skeletons. There may have been many more because the top of it was actually machined off. Um, they weren't expecting any more archaeology at that stage. Um, but it paused work, it was properly excavated, and then as a result of the interest of the television, it was subject to DNA analysis. And that analysis shows that there's a very high possibility that the individuals whose bodies were disposed of in that well were of Jewish heritage. There are men, women and children there. Some of the bodies have signs of violence on them. Um, they were almost certainly dead when they were thrown into the well, but not long dead because the bodies are intact. It was a dry well, so it's an unorthodox disposal of dead bodies. It's something that no, no community, not the Jewish community or the Christian community, would have considered a normal way to dispose of dead bodies. So it requires an explanation, and its explanation has been quite a long time coming because of the difficulty of dating human remains that don't have any material culture with them. So there's no jewellery here, there's no objects, um, but a whole series of carbon-14 dates have now been refined, and they place these remains close to the recorded events of 1190, where, if you remember from one of the first slides, there's a historical record that says that the Jews found in their homes in the cities were dragged out and murdered. So these are probably the remains of those unfortunate people. Um, that required a response from the city and a response that was appropriate to the horror of the event and to the sensitivities of the Jewish community. So the remains have been reburied in the Jewish section of Earlham Cemetery. And you'll find a commemorative plaque reasonably close to the site, although rather discreetly tucked into a corridor in the shopping centre. And if you choose to go to the cemetery and find them, you'll find a headstone and you'll see that people regularly leave pebbles on it in the Jewish custom. Moving on in historical dates, you may have seen this thing. It appeared in an exhibition in the Castle Museum a couple of years ago. It dates from the 1230s, which is a period when there were a number of these riot events described in the historical record. And we think it shows members of, or rather caricatures of members of the wider Jernit family and their business associates. It's a very interesting thing, um, partly because it gives people their actual names. So you'll see the names Moisha or Moses and Avagay or Abigail and Hake or Isaac labelled onto some of the people in this drawing. It's tiny, it's the heading of an exchequer roll and it's an informal drawing so even blown up like this you can see it better than you can on the real object. Um, but you can see that this is a caricature about money lending. So a figure with three faces, um, so somebody who can look all ways at once, and wearing a crown on his head, possibly Jernit in his close relationship with the king, is shown in the centre, and below him the devil is tweaking the noses of a money lender and a Jewish woman. Um, the Christian merchant on the extreme left is holding up a scale full of coins, which as you can see doesn't balance. So it's essentially an accusation of unfairness. And it's shown in the context, you can see on the right of the picture, of a castle which is full of demons. So the castle, the royal power in Norwich, is imposing this unfairness on the city. That's the story here. What's very interesting is that the gathered curtain along the bottom of the image, under the rail there, 
might indicate that what's being portrayed here is actually a scene from a play. So these may be the local apprentice boys dressed up as members of the Jewish community performing in masks and makeup in one of the city's play cycles. Um, otherwise, that curtain is a bit inexplicable, but they did those plays on carts, which were draped and decorated. So it's one theory of what this might actually be a drawing of. And unfortunately, we don't know who made this drawing. We don't know if it was a Norwich clerk or somebody from the Exchequer in London who'd come down to make this record, and maybe seen this play. This is a slightly more cheerful one because this is actually an object owned by the Jewish community and it's probably the only object that we have extant that belonged to the Jewish community in Norwich. Um, in the classic way of British antiquarianism it's called the Bodleian Bowl and it lives at the Ashmolean, so clear as mud, but it was found in a ditch or a moat in Norwich in the 17th century and there's some suggestion that that might have been around the Haymarket site, but it's very difficult to know. The reason that we know that this is an object from the Jewish community is that it has a Hebrew inscription around the middle of the vessel. It's a bronze vessel, um, a sort of small pot, uh, too small probably to be a cooking pot. And it says it's a gift by Joseph, the son of the Holy Rabbi Yale. And we know who he was. He was a famous medieval Talmudic scholar and he traveled around Europe. So he and his son Joseph went in 1260 from Paris to the Holy Land. Um, and the bowl probably is French, but this family owned property at Berry and property at Colchester. And there's every possibility that they were also active in the community in Norwich. So it sets a bit of a context of people moving around Europe at this high financial and scholarly level. Um, sadly, we don't really know what it was for. There's no obvious use for it in synagogue. It may have been used as part of people washing their hands before entering the building, or it may just have been a present. And then the other thing we have, which is so rare, I can't begin to tell you how rare, the only medieval Hebrew poet from England is a person from Norwich. He's called Mir ben Elijah. Uh, he lived in the later 13th century and his father was a rabbi. He probably didn't write his poems in Norwich or as he calls it, Norgitz, but he probably wrote them in France after the expulsion. So this may be a first-hand record of a person who had an actual experience of being expelled from England. Um, it was obviously important to him because he uses it as his acrostic and he wrote more than 20 lament poems in Hebrew which are preserved. They're actually preserved in the Vatican Library um, and this one in particular, this one which is generally called Put a Curse on My Enemies, is described as being about the heaviness of exile the slayings in prisons and financial ruin. And in line 10, which you can see at the bottom here, he talks about the people's disgust heard in the land. So he may be directly talking about the slanders against Jews in England and the expulsion. And that leads us to 1290, when Edward I more or less bowed to the mood in Europe and expelled the Jews from the kingdom. Um, you could take a strictly financial view of this and say he'd reached the point where the financial difficulties were greater than the financial rewards, or you could say it was a cultural movement that was spreading across Europe and in many ways connected to the beginning of crusader culture. In any way, it was a wave across Europe and in no small part it created the modern Jewish diaspora. So that diagram which bears looking at more closely in your own time shows how people left the west of Europe and resettled in the Mediterranean and North Africa but also in Eastern Europe. 
creating the substantial Jewish communities that then existed into the 19th century. And for the next 366 years, it wasn't legal to live in England as a practicing Jew. And as far as we're aware, no Jews stayed in Norwich during that period. The only official Jews in England were ones who had legally converted and forfeited their property. And they lived in something called the Domus Conversorum, which is a sort of workhouse in Chancery Lane in London. At the beginning of the expulsion, there were 80 people there, but the last of those had died by 1356. Um, there were another 48 people there in the 14th and 15th centuries, but it's very unclear where they had come from. They may have been refugees who'd arrived in England who were of Jewish heritage, um, but the records of that institution carry on up to 1609 and then stop. So there's still a gap between that institution and the readmission. So that's sort of our halfway point. And then we have a different story. So from 1656, we look at a new community, the readmission to the present day. And it starts under the Commonwealth. So in 1656, Jews were readmitted into England by Oliver Cromwell. And it was a, a slightly informal arrangement legally, but it relied on the conjunction of a number of different things. So the radical Puritans were much more interested in the Old Testament than recent Christians had been. They were also much more interested in liberty of conscience. Um, so they had a comparative respect for Jewish culture, but that was combined with an idea that was current in lots of Puritan sects that the conversion of the Jews was necessary to secure the second coming. So to have Jews present and treat them with respect was necessary in order to convert them. So it's a little bit backhanded. Um, but again, if you took a more economic argument, you could say that they also had a strong economic interest in trade with the low countries and boosting the commercial sector. And the first Jews that returned to England were Spanish Sephardim who'd been living in the Netherlands. Um, and they were hugely important to re-establishing international trade after the civil wars. So some of you will have seen Beavis Marks Synagogue. Um, a wonderful building well worth visiting next to Spitalfield Market. And that's the first place of Jewish worship built in the city since the, in the country since the Middle Ages. But as the trading communities spread out, of course, so did the Jews. And we have a Jewish community back in Norwich from 1750. In 1750, there's another legal contretemps there's a quarrel between the minister and the officers of the synagogue, which resulted in a summons. This took place somewhere called Gowings Court, which is off St. Stephen Street. And I can't find any images of Gowings Court. It seems to have been demolished quite early on, but it would have been somewhere in the middle of this image. This is the 1789 Holstetter map. Um, it's just too small a space to be labeled. And it would have been one of the Norwich yards, probably a rented room in a tenement. Um, it wasn't very grand and it was quite quickly moved on from. The next place we know about is also a rented tenement, but in a much better part of town at the top of Tim Land Alley uh, behind the Samson and Hercules. And there are some drawings of it here, which were done quite a lot later after it was out of use, uh, drawn in the 1860s or 70s when it was the coal hole for the Samson and Hercules. Um, but you can see that there's an arc in the wall of that building. So it was at least adapted, if not built, for synagogue use. Uh, there was a minister, Leon Mordecai, described as a good person in lots of ways. He was also the slaughterman and he was paid by the community. So there were enough people in the community to gather the money to pay the salary for the minister. And this is where we start to see Jewish owned businesses in crafts and trades in the record. So the chap in the picture there is Barnett Crawcore. Crawcore is probably a version of Krakow and indicates that he may well have been Polish as we would now describe it. Um, 
he crops up a lot as a leader in the community over the next two generations. So he lived until 1835 and was buried at the Guildencroft. Um, he was a dentist. He moved here from London. Uh, we know that he lived at least part of his life on Magdalen Street. There was a Mr. Marks, who was an upholsterer on Gentleman's Walk. There was Levi Isaac, who was a silversmith, Phineas Jacobs, a tobacconist, Joel Fox, a furrier, David Soman in the shoe industry, Aaron Simpson, a confectioner, lots of people establishing themselves in the Norwich trades and professions. Many of these people were probably younger sons, so their families probably had established businesses in London and they were branching out, going to new towns that were growing and developing and Norwich was having one of its periods as the second city and it was an obvious place to come. And they started to establish what you might call Jewish services and facilities. Started to look for places of burial. The first one that we know of is on Horns Lane behind Bear Street. And that opened about 1750 and was used until 1826. Um, it then closed slightly accidentally. So the lease had been held by members of the Levy family and they died out leading to the rent not being paid. So the owner released it as a market garden and had the burial stones removed. And that wasn't intentional. But when that happened, Barnett Crocourt and others uh, took action and leased a piece of land from the Norwich Quakers at Guildencroft, uh, which is where he is buried. And that's a small cemetery which survives now. You can go and have a look at it, but most of the stones have been cleared back. So I've included a picture of it from the 1930s, which shows it in slightly better condition. Um, and then from the 1850s to now, part of the main Earlham Cemetery is dedicated to Jewish use and has its own small mortuary chapel in it. And that's against the Bothwick Road. And from the middle of the 19th century, um, the leaders of the community felt that the time was right to build a purpose-built large synagogue. They were obviously by this time happy and confident to be a visible presence in the city and able to raise quite a lot of money. They raised a mortgage of £700. Um, might have been a little over ambitious because they eventually struggled to pay it off. But what they did with that was build this large neoclassical building at uh, the corner of Mount Gate. Um, which was then renamed the street going in front of it. So this mountain gate at the side of it and the street going in front of it was then renamed Synagogue Street and was the only synagogue street in England for quite a long period of time. And from this period as well, there's all the usual sort of social initiatives that you would expect a religious community growing in confidence to have. So there's ladies' society, charity campaigns, young people's socials, lots of you know newsletters so we start to be able to see an archive of day-to-day -day life and to identify significant figures and one of the most significant is Simon Caro who was the minister all the way from 1840 to 1872 and was there at the opening of this synagogue and he and his wife Mariah are buried in the Earlham Cemetery section um, that's a picture of him in old age, looking extremely sort of grand and traditional. There are more dashing pictures of him as a younger man as well. And throughout the 19th century, the Jewish community became a small but sort of perfectly mainstream part of civic and economic life in the city. Jewish interests continued to be mainly focused on skilled trades, medical practice and commercial businesses. Um, there were 28 families registered in the 1840s, almost all of them what we would call fairly middle class, and the better off ones increasingly moved out of the city centre, just like other middle class businessmen were doing, and built themselves houses in the suburbs. So in the bottom right there, you can see Alfred Holdstein and the house at Thorpe Lodge, now Broadland District Council, where he lived after he left the city centre. 
um, many of the families were business proprietors um, and like other business proprietor families in the city they became involved in civil life so Joel Fox was the first Jewish town councillor and Alfred Haldenstein was sheriff um, and if you look at the top picture you can see the building that's currently Cafe Nero which was Joel Fox's furrier's warehouse and before that a coffee house in which Emma Hamilton had performed tasteful poses so it was probably at its most respectable when it was Joel Fox's fur warehouse. Then we have this rather hard-faced photograph of Michael Samuel, who was the Lord Mayor of the city in 1912. And he is the first prominent sort of national level politician from Norwich acknowledged to have been Jewish. Um, he was related to Haldensteins as well. And all of his family members were successful business people in the city. Um, he was, Lord Mayor here, and then he became a Conservative MP. That wasn't in Norwich, which was a safe Labour seat at the time, but he came from Norwich. And when he was elevated to the House of Lords in 1937, he chose Baron Mancroft of Mancroft as his title. Um, rather sadly, his son changed the family's surname to Mancroft, maybe to anglicise it. Um, losing Samuels. So his name actually now is Mancroft, and you probably mostly remember the present Lord Mancroft for making unpleasant remarks about nurses a few years ago. But uh, they started here. <laughs> then we get to the war years, and the community had grown quite substantially. So through the 20s and 30s, Jews in Europe who were able, of course, were escaping the rise of fascism. And the community here, like other communities in England, was working hard to raise money and help people to settle. Uh, the Norfolk and Norwich Committee for Refugees, which had Jewish community members on its board, uh, was successful in bringing 90 children out of Germany and Austria to the city. Um, the synagogue on Synagogue Street, unfortunately, was destroyed in a direct hit in 1942, fortunately in the middle of the night. And one of the interesting stories, apart from the sad destruction of that site, was that the community were immediately offered alternative spaces for worship by local churches. And for the next six years, they used the Spiritualist Church Hall in Chapel Field. And the Spiritualists were so welcoming to the community that they instigated a side door on the building so that they wouldn't have to walk under the sign of the cross in order to enter the building. You can go and look at that, that's still there. Um, if you look at the top picture there, you'll see one of the few surviving bits of the synagogue are those rusticated blocks from the pillars. And you may know those as forming the gateposts to the current synagogue on Earlham Road. It took a long time to get that building together. Um, in 1948, the community moved into a prefab on the site, but the new synagogue wasn't opened until 1968. Uh, we've got an image of its consecration there. Now, I'm not going to continue much here into the modern Jewish community of Norwich because I only know it as a friend and it's an active community that some of you may well be members of, but it's, Active, lively, last recorded as being 983 individuals in the county, but almost certainly hundreds more people, even thousands who are people of Jewish heritage, but don't identify as religious. Um, obviously, the development of UEA from the 60s onwards has brought new academics and students from all over the world to take part in Jewish life in the city. And since 1989, there has also been a liberal Jewish community worshipping in the city. They currently worship at the old meeting on Colgate. So it's an active and lively community living in the city now. And that's how we've ended up at a position where we are creating a heritage group. So I'm presently working for Norfolk Record Office on a National Lottery Heritage Fund supported project called Community Archives Skills Support and Sustainability. And the idea of that project is to bring training and skills and resources to community groups who look after their own archives. 
And last year, I was discussing that project, amongst other things, with members of the Norwich Hebrew community on, uh, at the Olam Road Synagogue. And it became clear that there wasn't such a special interest heritage group for the Jewish community in the city. So now we've got one. We've got the Norwich Jewish Heritage Group, the NJHG. It's open to everyone who's interested in Jewish heritage. You don't have to be Jewish to take part. And it's working on projects on different things, oral history, cataloging the records of the synagogue, looking at what's held by the NRO, all sorts of things. And the plan is to build an archive and make it available online. So anybody who's welcome in take, um, is welcome to join us in taking up part of that work and get involved. And you can email me and there's an online form that you can fill in to join the mailing list. And hopefully we'll get some well-experienced Norwich Society historians who would like to help us, particularly with some of the record office work. Um, so I'm almost at the end and I'm going to leave you with some things that you could read if you wanted to get more interested in the subject of Jews in Norwich and Norfolk. And then I will stop my screen share and I'd be delighted to take any questions. Well, thank you, Sophie. That was that was fascinating. A lot of things. <laughs> it's a whistle stop, isn't it? <laughs> Very interesting. Um, OK, we have a number of questions that come in. Um, first of all, going back to the medieval times, um, what language was spoken by the Jewish community or what languages? You say they came from France? Almost certainly French, the same language that would have been used by the majority of better off or more educated people in England at the time. Mm -hmm. So they would have been literate in Hebrew for religious purposes, certainly all the adult men. Um, and that's one of the key differences between Jewish and Christian culture at the time. All of the adult men and a large number of the women would have been literate. Um, so they'd have used Hebrew, they'd have used French, probably in day-to-day -day conversation. They probably had a degree of literacy in Latin for legal work. Um, and obviously, as a community that settled in the middle of the city, many of them probably developed fluency in the forms of English that were current. And I say forms because it's pretty unclear how much English, as we understand it, would have been being spoken in the middle of Norwich in the late 12th century. Um, probably some late Anglo-Scandinavian toned Old English to Middle English crossover. Mm -hmm. um, very different from what would have been spoken in the countryside, very different from what would have been spoken in other towns. Um, I think it, it's useful to think of most people in a medieval city as being functionally multilingual in the same way that most people would be in a big trading city now in most of Africa or Asia using different languages for different purposes but day to day in the house probably French. And then when the expulsion came in 1290 I mean did they these people just up and go or were they mm. moved along? Or? Well this is very interesting because theoretically, all their property was confiscated and they were kicked out just like that. But there is a certain amount of evidence, um, which you can trace in Lippmann's book, that some of them were able to move assets to France. They were very well connected at court. And I think there was a degree of awareness that this was coming. You know, so there seems to have been the opportunity for the smarter people to get some of their assets out. And leaving aside what happened in 1190 and 1235, at 1290, there doesn't seem to have been violence in Norwich. Mm. There's no particular sign that people were hurt in the course of the expulsion. So it seems more or less like there was a, a deadline, it was leaked, people knew about it, and they made arrangements. Of course, some of those arrangements may simply to have been changing their names and moving in with their Christian relatives because there are mixed marriages in medieval Norfolk so some people may just have gone under the radar but the better known families with uh, cross-channel businesses seem to have had some opportunity to move to the other shop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, another question, um, are you aware of the rude screen at All Saints Church in Loddon? 
I am nasty bloodstained thing. <laughs> I chose to use the Norwich picture partly because it's Norwich picture, but also because it's much less gruesome. No. How many churches, I mean, roughly have William images? Not many, no. not many. Um, no more than three or four old ones and far fewer later ones. Mm. I think, you know, despite the, the church, both before and after the Reformation, having moved very slowly on dealing with its history of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. I think it's been a while now since people were comfortable with blood libel saints in England. So the images of St. William of Norwich are very limited. And those of the two little St. Hughes, Lincoln and York, are nearly as limited. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to be quite an extremist now to find people actively venerating those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A question about the 1849 synagogue. Are, yes. there, are there any plans surviving? Haven't found any building plans yet, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if we didn't find them in our work in the record office. It will depend whether the architect was one that continued. Um, we found the building plans for the 60s synagogue, so we're working our way backwards. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I'm not aware of them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure which firm it was. I'd have to look that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so this has been absolutely fascinating. I mean, you've managed to give a very scholarly talk in a very approachable way, and it uh, has really made this uh, live for us. So, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you. thank you very much. I hope it will encourage people to explore more. Yeah, well, it certainly opened uh, a lot of avenues, I think, for, for, for people. So thank you very much indeed.